Good morning from Austria, ladies and gentlemen. You're seeing a big smile on my face because Austria won against the Ukraine last night. So we are going to Wembley to beat Italy, hopefully. Um, but this presentation obviously is not going to be about football. It is about the monetary climate change. And in the next 20 minutes, I will give you a brief wrap up of the 2021 in gold we trust report that we just published. Um, the title of it is Monetary Climate Change. And of course, it's a bit of a provocative title, but we wanted to make clear in this report that the current move in inflation is not temporary or transitory, but that is a real paradigm shift that we're seeing. And the reasons for this paradigm shift, this will be the main topic of this presentation now. But before I wanted to thank our premium partners, without their support, it wouldn't be possible to put out such a big report, 350 pages in German and in English without um, charging anything. So this is really the cream of the crop in the, um, in the gold industry. And we're really, really thankful for their support. Let's jump into my favorite topic, the topic of gold. What is the status quo of gold? Well, obviously last week has been pretty tough for us. We saw a pretty big drawdown. Um, in gold, we saw a strong move uh, in bond markets. We saw a strong move in the US dollar, and we saw some sort of a um, sector rotation. From my point of view, the reaction by market participants was a bit too strong. I don't think that market participants realize that now fiscal stimulus is much more important than monetary policy. And I think this is really one of the main paradigm shifts that we are seeing now. But let's just have a look at the performance table. Well, obviously last year, gold did a tremendous job in such a volatile and um, nervous and turbulent year like 2020, gold was up 24% in US dollar terms. It was up 15% in Euro terms. It was up 20% in British pound terms. It was up in every major currency and it made new all time highs. So gold like a solid um, defender or a reliable gold keep, goalkeeper, it really did its job. Now this year, um, we're down 6.6% now. Obviously, we're seeing a stronger dollar. We're seeing some headwinds uh, coming, especially from, from, from China. And we're seeing that um, in the commodity space um, that, that most commodities actually outperformed gold. So we are not seeing this inflation trade. We are rather seeing this reflation trade at the moment. However, I think that having a look at this chart, I think it makes a very strong case for gold. As you can see here, the annual average price of gold has reached a new all-time high in 2021. Gold is up 10.2% on average with a compounded annual growth rate of 8% since 1971, the IPO of gold. So gold, I would say, did a pretty good job in the last couple of years, in the last couple of decades. However, I think that market expectations were a bit too high. People expected Bitcoin-like um, performances, but gold, as I've said before, I think gold did its job. It hedged against inflation. Uh, it worked in, in times of uh, um, uh, enormous volatility in equity markets and it acted as a recession hedge. And those are three very, very important um, 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 uh, roles that gold plays in your portfolio. But let's have a look at this monetary climate change that we're actually um, uh, explaining in the In Gold We Trust report 2021. Henry Maxey said, the death of inflation 
has been greatly exaggerated. And as you can see on this chart that shows the CPI since the year 2002, in 2019, we mentioned this cover by Bloomberg Business Week saying, is inflation dead? And now you can see Barron's had inflation, the I word on its front page again. So clearly inflation isn't a contrarian topic anymore. It has gone mainstream, but if you follow the narrative from central bankers and politicians, it is only temporary. It is not structural. But as you can see on this chart, compared to 2008, 2009, this time around, inflation rates actually, actually rose during the recession. It is the first time since the 1970s that the CPI rose or has risen in the cause of a recession. Now, what are the main reasons? First of all, we are seeing a move from monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. This is why I said at the beginning, we should focus more on fiscal dominance. I think the fact that um, Janet Yellen, as a former head of the Federal Reserve, is now treasury secretary. This symbolic character cannot be overestimated. So we're seeing much more, a much more close cooperation between fiscal and monetary policy, but fiscal policy is getting more and more important. And we're losing track of those big numbers. I mean, $1 trillion used to be a big number. Uh, the two big packages, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act and the CARES Act, together 3.8 trillion. If you would line up this amount of money with $1 bills, you could actually travel to Mars and back again. That's a pretty long distance. And I think it helps to visualize those numbers because everybody is just getting used to um, those big numbers. But the big question obviously is who will finance all this debt? And if you have a look at this chart, I mean, it's fairly obvious that central banks are taking this role. Just at this year, in this year, the federal, um, the, the US Treasury has to refinance 8.1 trillion. And if you compare this chart, the, the move recently to 2008, 2009, you can see that the numbers are more than 100% higher than back then. Let's have a look at monetary growth. M2 compared to uh, 2008, 2009. M2 grew by 25% last year compared to 2008, 2009, when the broader monetary aggregates actually collapsed and only high powered money, so central bank uh, 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 created money, M1, MZM, uh, were searching, but credit growth was collapsing. This is a big difference between now and 2008, 2009. Now the broader monetary aggregates are rising big time. And it is also important to say that those numbers are significantly higher than in the 1970s, a decade that was highly inflationary. Let's have a look at this chart. As you can see, M2 and CPI are highly correlated. But 2008, 2009, they went down together. Now M2 has risen significantly, but CPI is still in the very low areas. Now, one of the main reasons for that is obviously that the savings rate due to all the COVID restrictions has risen significantly. In the US, which is obviously uh, quite a consumer or consumption driven economy, by the end of the year 2020, the savings rate was at 16%. And of course, this coincides with the velocity of money that has collapsed last year. From my point of view, 
now that that uh, people are getting vaccinated and 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 that we're seeing that economies are opening up again, I think visibility for consumers for uh, entrepreneurs will come back. People will start consuming, will start um, capital investments again because there's not now more visibility on the horizon. Of course, there's the Delta variant uh, and we all don't really know how it's going to develop. But I think the worst is really over when it comes to COVID. And this implies that the velocity of money will start rising again. And as you can see on this chart, velocity is also highly correlated to the inflation rate. So our main view is velocity will start rising and will, um, will lead to higher inflation rates. Another reason why we think that it's not temporary, but rather a structural phenomenon is the big move to inflation, uh, to average inflation targeting that the Federal Reserve announced last year in August. So this means that the Federal Reserve has much more leeway. It actually wants inflation rates to overshoot because inflation was undershooting over the last couple of years. And in our report, we are making um, some scenarios how high actually inflation rates will be allowed to rise if we want to achieve this 2% on average. Another big structural change. People ask me, will MMT um, happen in the US? And my reply is, it is already happening. Um, Stephanie Kelton, who was in the, in the team of Bernie Sanders, she's now also a very, very influential advisor of the Biden administration. And from my point of view, as far as I can tell from, from, from the last couple of packages, from the last couple of moves, I think this is clearly um, a direction um, on the path of MMT that we're seeing in the United States. Before COVID, MMT, UBI, helicopter money, that was only something that was proposed by, I would say, um, economists on the rather left side of the spectrum. Now it is really mainstream and it is being implemented. Another trigger for rising inflation is a Cold War 2.0. If you look at this picture from the last summit between China and the US, it took place in Alaska. So I think the symbolic character is also very important. Uh, uh, everything that I read um, said that the mood was pretty cold and uh, not really friendly. And this is something that we saw at the G7 uh, uh, summit as well. China is now the big competitor. It is rather than a competitor, I would say it is now the big enemy of the Western world. Of course, this will have an inflationary impact. Now, in the report, we describe much more drivers for inflation like demographics that is turning inflationary. Uh, we expect a, a weaker US dollar. Now we're seeing a small bounce, but structurally we see a weaker US dollar. A big move in commodities. We're seeing that central banks now have different mandates, it seems, talking about climate change and inclusion and things like that. I don't want to judge that, but it is not, uh, a real mandate of the ECB of, or the Federal Reserve. But those are topics that are more and more discussed. Let's have a look at the inflation beta of several asset classes. Well, actually, if you think that inflation is not a temporary phenomenon, then you want some inflation hedges. Now, what works best in inflation? It is commodities with an inflation beta of four and gold with an inflation beta of 2.1.
when it comes to commodities, many people are talking about a new commodity cycle. From my point of view, we are seeing a strong move out of financial assets into real assets. Have a look at this very long-term chart. It would suggest that we are now really at the beginning of a long-term cycle in the commodity space. And in the report, we make a strong case for a renaissance of the commodity space. However, as we say, and we saw that last week already, the move recently was a bit too much. Commodities are still very much overbought. So from my point of view, we will see some cooling off. We will see that the commodity space will take a breather perhaps over the summer, but I think that is really the beginning of a big um, commodity super cycle. So for the short, perhaps medium term, uh, I think we have to be a bit more picky. We have to, to, to invest into smaller uh, uh, drawdowns. We have to take the opportunities, but I think um, the next couple of weeks might be uh, a little bit more rough compared to the last couple of months that saw the beginning of a really big move. Inflation is the pain trade for bondholders. What you can see here is the negative yielding debt index. There's still 12 trillion invested in negative yielding debt. If market participants realize that inflation is not temporary, but rather a structural phenomenon, and that the 2% is not the ceiling, but rather the bottom, then I think we will see an exodus out of the bond market. And you can see how duration works with this 100 year Austrian century um, bond. Um, we saw a yield increase from 0.45% from to 1.1%, uh, and it led to a loss of almost 40%. So if inflation really becomes a topic, then I think uh, on the bond side, there will be there will be blood. Um, and have a look at this chart from a portfolio point of view. Most people think that this correlation, this negative correlation between equities and bonds is something that we had forever. Actually, this is not the case. This is the exception to the rule. Out of the last 100 years, 70 percent, uh, in 70 years, we saw a positive correlation between equities and bonds. So if inflation really becomes a topic, then I think bonds will not be your equity hedge in the portfolio. That's a very, very important thing from a portfolio point of view. Miners are more profitable than ever. 2020 was the best year in terms of free cash flow for the top 50 miners. This year will even be, be better. However, it is not reflected by markets. Of course, this is some sort of a fun chart, but it shows how extreme the valuation differences were. Mid-May, of course, this has changed slightly recently. The valuation of Dogecoin, which is a meme coin and doesn't have any utility whatsoever, except for sponsoring the Jamaican uh, bobsled team, was at 70 billion higher than the market cap of Newmont Mining or Barrick Gold, the two largest gold miners. But I think at some point, market participants will realize that there's a tremendous amount of value on the balance sheets of the gold mining industry. Now, where are we going from here? Gold is still very, very cheap. On an inflation adjusted basis, we would have to go to 2,300 US dollars to make a new inflation adjusted all time high. From a technical point of view, we are seeing this long, really interesting um, cup and handle pattern. Here, this is the cup, obviously, this is the handle. I expected this breakout actually already uh, over the last couple of weeks. Now we saw another drawdown. But if you have a look at the KST and the copper curve, all turning bullish now, MACD is giving a positive signal. So I think from a technical point of view, it's still looking very, very well. Our option-based model 
is suggesting that the probability of making new 52 week highs in the next year or this year is actually 44% while the probability of making new 52 week lows is only 4.9%. So from our point of view, it is a pretty good entry point because now sentiment has cooled off dramatically. People say that, well, now the Federal Reserve is really uh, has really become much, much more hawkish. Although if you really read through the dot plots, if you read through the FOMC statements, it is not really a hawkish statement. It is still extremely dovish. Now I'm already coming to an end and a conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. As I've said, this is only a brief wrap up of 350 pages of research might be a good read for the summer vacation. A monetary climate change is on the horizon. Fiscal policy is much more important than monetary policy. And of course, fiscal policy has a much more direct impact on inflation and uh, economic growth than monetary stimulus. We're seeing a significantly increased probability of a longer term inflationary phase. And this is actually what everybody wants. This is what politicians need. There's no way of growing out of this debt trap. Real interest rates will remain negative for the years to come. From my point of view, if there would be only one indicator for gold, it would be real interest rates. And we simply cannot afford positive real rates anymore. Decentralized cryptocurrency will not replace physical gold as an investment, but are gaining in importance. From my point of view, gold and Bitcoin aren't enemies. I think they can uh, work well, pretty, pretty good together. This is what we're doing in two of our investment funds, gold for stability and uh, cryptos for convexity. Mining stocks will have the most profitable year in history in 2021 but nobody's really noticing it. From a technical point of view, we're seeing a very favorable environment. And we see, and this is really the update of our long-term gold price model that we, um, record, that we introduced last year. We see that we are right on track for a gold price of 4,800 US dollars by the end of this decade. And we think it's, uh, quite possible that we see new all-time highs in gold this year. So ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this, have a look at our webpage, have a look at the 2021 in Gold We Trust report. And now I thank you very, very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. I did so. I look forward to meeting you all in person again. And now thumbs crossed or fingers crossed, for Austria going to Wembley on Saturday. Thank you very much for your attention.